just a, a few uh, brief words of introduction from myself. Uh, certainly, uh, the Western liberal order and democracy are, are being challenged. Uh, but I find that uh, in many of the punditry and expert talk, there's, there's overly doom and gloom. Maybe, maybe people do need to be doomed and gloom so that they wake up uh, to the challenge uh, that, that we are confronting. Uh, and that is because evil can always come back. And unfortunately, history is all too filled with examples of that. And on a personal note, I unfortunately had to witness that in 1990 in my country uh, that went down the hellhole uh, of doom and gloom. And exactly as others and the Prime Minister and the Ambassador and, and Nurcha and Alina have said, it is about resistance. It is about uh, the moment where you need to stand up, be counted, however a minority one is, or one person or several, to stand up to that danger. I will stop there. Uh, we have a terrific panel that's been already introduced. And I will ask uh, my fellow panelists uh, to speak for about five to seven minutes so that we have time uh, before giving the floor to uh, Konstantin here. Uh, Jan and I didn't agree on the color code of orange, but I think it works well to so give a bit of color to these gray suits. Konstantin. Thank you very much, Ayan. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this significant event. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel uh, challenge. Uh, I don't believe that um, there is a, a supplementary need to say that uh, the words that I'm going to say are mine and only mine. It's happened that uh, in the backyard of my garden uh, house, uh, country house, I have, uh, due to the poor soil, there is a small area where in dry season the grass turned uh, turn, uh, yellow. Uh, yet, uh, when uh, the rain comes, uh, we have a, I have again uh, green, green uh, grass. Um, what are the lessons from, from this small uh, problem? First of all, obviously, I'm a lazy guy. If I irrigated, uh, this problem never, uh, never occurred. Uh, second is that uh, I have to recognize and to nourish the roots. Thirdly, if you have strong roots, you can survive major crises. I believe that something similar happened, uh, can, apply to, can apply to our Western Atlantic uh, world. Uh, I, I will give just two examples. First of all, it's about uh, our Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian roots. I hope that you will remember the debate that we have on unissued constitutional European constitution, when in the foreword we failed to accept the idea to introduce the Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian roots. It's, it's not a question of religion, it's just a question of recognizing who we are. It's just a question of accepting that along with Greek and Roman uh, uh, heritage, Judeo-Christian roots are the backbone of our civilization. Secondly, it's a question of uh, value. It seems to me that lately we take freedom as granted. Uh, uh, we forgot uh, that our ancestors for a century for freedom, and we forgot that freedom came, uh, comes with uh, personal responsibility, responsibilities and come, come also with rules. And rules are very simple and they were formulated by Plato millennia ago. Uh, when you are a member of a community or a, or a city, you have to obey the rules of the city. Uh, but you are encouraged to try to change the rule of the city according to your views. But you are more welcome if you don't succeed in this change, to leave the city. Uh, in order to preserve the roots and the values, you have to have resources uh, and means. Resources are limited. So maybe we may forget Normandy, maybe we may forget Pinay Berliner, but I don't believe that we can afford 
to, uh, to spend our limited resources in overlapping program and not, uh, and not in a very transparent way. So to conclude, uh, I personally don't believe that uh, the answer is necessary now to your to the question of the panel. I personally believe that we have a problem, and those problems are not due to some uh, 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 poor alien knocking on the heaven's door of our cities, but because of our uh, Eastern friends pushing us to the limit. It's because of us that we don't want to recognize, unfortunately, and nourish, and fight for our values, for our roots and values. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, and if I can transpose your grass metaphor and the roots uh, to institutions, which are the grass in which uh, our values live, it is important to live and uh, nurture those institutions every day. And Jan Tehau, uh, as he was leaving Carnegie, wrote his piece about how he saw the, the future of Europe and its possibilities. So Jan, please take over the baton. First of all, thanks for noting the joint color code that we have here today. When you have a Dutch wife and three children that speak Dutch better than German, then wearing something orange on occasion actually keeps the peace at home. And, um, and that's important. I think um, it, one of the purposes of these conferences is, of course, to increase the level of confusion about the worries that we have. Um, and when we are talking at this level about globalization, uh, and world order, um, the, the level of confusion is particularly big, uh, especially in those who talk about it all the time. Um, for me, the, you know, to kind of cut through the fog a little bit, for me the central uh, frame of reference or paradigm, if that's the word you want to use, is globalization. Uh, we need to take globalization, I think, as the framework, as the context of this, and the triumph of the Western, of the Western way, which really is globalization, globalization is a triumph of the Western way, the way we um, trade, the way we deal with what we consider to be valid values um, and, uh, and the institutional framework of it and the massive buy-in of other players who came in into globalization over the last 25 years and perhaps even before that um, is, a, is a triumph of the West um, and if there is a crisis of the West and Western liberal order then it's homemade um, because basically the kind of offer that we made to the globe was universal, not universally but you know, largely accepted by the entire rest of the bunch. And that's something that we forget, you know, um, and, and of course, as in all triumphs, there's the risk, of course, for your downfall already kind of you know, built into the triumph. Uh, and I think the, the, the biggest problem is that we fail to appreciate and fail to understand and adapt to our own success. Um, you know, we uh, did not adapt to our own creature, um, and that is globalization. Uh, it wasn't clear to us that when you actually add uh, to the game a huge number of additional players, then the game changes. And then you have to change if you want to still be the one who sets the standard in the game. And that seems, seems to be a you know, very simplistic logic and a simplistic truth, but I think we were you know, too triumphant and too complacent to adapt. You know, uh, the examples are manifold, um, you know, from uh, not reforming the IMF and the World Bank, uh, Bank enough, um, you know, to well reform, if you will. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, clinging to privilege was a problem as well. You know, we thought that we were running the show, um, but then the, the show starts to run you, um, and then, you know, the surprise is great. Um, so we, we, I think the Western failure to adapt to the triumph it has created is one of the biggest problems that we have here. Um, and then that's kind of the external dimension of this. And then there's an internal dimension as well, and I have called this um, sophisticated state failure which is a Western affliction pretty much across the board, across the Western world. What is sophisticated state failure? Sophisticated state failure is the situation where you have functioning states, you have elections that bring about change of power, you have uh, tax authorities that work, you have police that work, you have judicial systems that work. Your system works, you're not Somalia. Your institutions do function, and yet they do not solve problems. At least not the big ones, not the ones that make or break the future. We have gotten used to selling small reform as big reform, and we have ignored the big stuff, whether that's at the global level or at our respective national levels. We've not, we've not had pension reform in the UK for 25 years. Germany hasn't had tax reform in 30 years. Um, France is notoriously unreformable in the labor market, um, just to name a few uh, examples, and you can actually apply this to many other countries um, to, uh, 
uh, in the wider in the wider West. Uh, less certainly, I talked to a colleague from Israel the other day. The same symptoms there of what I would call sophisticated state failure. So you can be actually quite happy about how great your system works, and then at the same time, um, it doesn't really solve the problems, and that discredits the system itself. That breeds populism. Um, that stifles growth, and that you know hollows out the core of globalization. Because the Western countries, when they don't develop, when their progress is minimal, um, then the core can't hold much longer. And uh, if you add to this the middle class squeeze, you know, a distribution problem uh, to a certain extent, uh, and that's something that I think Sinan will talk about, which is the technological revolution that puts a lot of angst into our system. You have a situation where the West feels that it's hollowed out, and it has hollowed out itself. Um, and, uh, and reform is very, very hard to get. And as a consequence, you know, we're weaker abroad. We're much weaker abroad. Um, and uh, and we, we seem to be unable uh, to, to play the role as, as, as the uh, kind of benign enforcer in the global order. Professor Krause yesterday uh, in the Aspen Institute uh, conference that we had uh, the day before this one, um, you know, um, described very impressively how you need a hegemon, a kind hegemon, who on occasion is the enforcer of the rules. The West played that role, mostly the United States. If the enforcer gets weak back home, you know, the enforcement of the rules um, can't take place any longer, and the rivals and those who have felt uncomfortable with the order feel encouraged to actually undermine it. And I think that's a situation that we're very clearly in. And, uh, and, and something that is very important, you know, also when you talk about the hegemon, that's, that's kind of a nasty word, we don't want to use it anymore. Um, but you know, what is often forgotten when you do have a benign hegemon, you don't only have an arbiter of last resort, you also have an enormous trust infusion into a system. An infusion and an, an understanding on behalf, of, on behalf of those who are part of the system that there is somebody who in the end will take care of things. Um, and, uh, and that you know, makes it possible for those actually to forget rivalries and to come to grips. And the European Union is a very, very clear example of this, I think. When the United States became the dominant power of Europe, um, after the Second World War, and not a European power was <coughs> dominant power in Europe, that created the kind of trust so that Germans and the French could all of a sudden work together and forget 2,000 years of grievances. Um, and when that trust is being taken out of the system again, as it has been done over the last 25 years, pretty systematically, the old grievances come back again. Uh, and that's an additional weakness that we have created for ourselves. And then finally, of course, there is a military element to all of this. Again, Constantine uh, uh, talked about the resources that we need to generate. If we are hollowed out, resources will be scarce, and the resources also will lack on the military side. And the military side is not, you know, not even primarily about interventions. It is mostly about the ability to issue security guarantees. Can you, in a credible way, tell somebody you will be safe and thereby take the angst away, and at the same time, of course, influence that you know other partners' behavior? If you lose that ability or at least lose the credibility, uh, then again, you know, uh, being the arbiter of last resort and being the enforcer of the rules becomes quite difficult. Um, I made a, uh, this is the not so gloomy um, end of my little presentation here. I made a joke yesterday in my presentation at the other conference about the Bruce Springsteen memoirs that I'm reading at the moment. And uh, then yesterday during dinner, uh, last night, I received an email from a colleague of mine who's running a journal in Berlin who wants me to write a review but trying to give a Bruce Springsteen memoir a transatlantic twist. And I've been thinking about this ever since because it's quite an interesting task. And I was thinking that when you look at what Bruce Springsteen has done, you know, coming from a very humble background with, you know, fairly limited skills, both on the singing and on the instrumental side, but it was an unbelievable ability to tell the story right and to have the confidence that his plight had a universal dimension that there was a truth in it that, you know, that resonated with others, being sensitive about it, but at the same time being very confident about it, doing it with as much skill as you can, but still you know, not in an intrusive way, but as an offer. If we tell our story as the West, you know, the same way that Bruce Springsteen was turning his New Jersey childhood into the biggest rock star career of all time, then I think we have a bright future as the West. Thank you very much. Terrific. I'm, I'm reminded of, of Hegel's thought that nothing has been done in history without passion. And I think people like Bruce Springsteen do exude passion. And as the ambassador was quoting uh, Secretary Kerry at our event uh, at GMF in, in Brussels, that you know you need friends to remind you, you know, how great uh, an accomplishment you have done when you are down. 
And I think we need to infuse uh, Europe, in this case, uh, with much more of that passion and reminder. Um, Arkady, uh, to you now on uh, continuing this discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And it's a real honor for me uh, to be invited to address the Eucharist Forum. My intervention will echo a lot of uh, what, what Jan has just said. Uh, the title of our panel is a question mark. Uh, for me, there is no question mark. The liberal order is under siege. It is challenged. I'm not in it. I'm not yet in the yet in the doom and gloom mood. I still have hopes, and I'll come to that in the end. But I have to admit that I believe that the the challenge is very serious, and it is the fact that especially Europe. Uh, used to underestimate this challenge. That is one component, uh, one component of the whole problem. So I will try to uh, offer you one explanation of why it is uh, under siege. And as a Russia scholar living in Europe, I will obviously also approach it through the prism of maybe Russian-European relations. So I don't want to generalize it too much, uh, but this is, I, I think, is, is appropriate and relevant. And in order to understand where we are now, we should ask ourselves a question why it was not under siege in the 90s. And it was not under siege in the 90s because it was, and more importantly, uh, had a capacity to project the image of being a success story. So it was a success story and it had an external image of being a success story worth being part of. And then something started to change. It was not just about the, victory, the then recent victory in the Cold War. It was about something bigger. And then the things started to change. Our leadership learned not to take anything, any underachievement, any failure, as a failure, as a drama. So what happened with Europe in particular, it was that it started time after time to fail or failing to impress its own citizens, first of all. When all citizens believe that they live, well, in the best of the worlds, in the most functional of all the worlds available, then the challenge is bound to be much weaker. Then no external challenger will have a, res a resonance uh, that, as we see now, some of them are having. Let's remember, who remembers now the Lisbon Agenda of 2000? A plan to make Europe the most competitive economy in the world. We didn't achieve anything, and we just turned the page. We don't want to say that we have that plan. Let's look at the foreign and security policy, at the ambitious plans, at the vanity projects that were announced and which were never completed. Let's remember that at some point, in, instead of going out into the field and trying to extend the liberal space, we started to deal with kind of autocrats, uh, hoping that, you know, well, this is the real politique and it's going to be fine. So instead of enlarging, extending the liberal order, we accepted that we're not going to do it anymore. And this is like riding the bicycle. You either ride it or you, or you, or you, or you fall. Now we're moving even further. We no longer can guarantee in Europe the personal safety of our citizens. And I'm sorry to say, I mean, terrorism is one thing. Terrorism is, tra is, is, is a real tragedy. But speaking about functioning police, things which happened in Cologne, and I'm telling this as a father because my daughter is going to be an exchange student in the University of Bonn in this, this semester. I am concerned. I'm not certain that the German police is doing its job in places like those on issues not, had, that have nothing to do with, with terrorism uh, the way I would like it. It, to do the job. And if we go further, so we are lowering the level of our ambitions and we are raising the level uh, at which we can accept misperformance. And then we expect the citizens to still like the system and not to look around. So when your own citizens are not impressed anymore, at least large segments of this, maybe the minority, I'm not talking about the majorities, of course, the search for alternative simply has to become. And this is what the non-liberal and anti-liberal regimes in the world sense. And this is the context in which they act. What is the good news here? 
The good news is that objectively speaking, in terms of economics, but also military power, the liberal world is still stronger than its competitors. For how long it will continue, I don't know, but for now it is stronger. Uh, well, I have to make a caveat that I don't know. I know that Europe has military muscles, but I don't know to what extent these muscles are for the podium and to what extent these muscles are for the fight. Uh, as a normal human being, I, I also like to choose peace over war. But there are situations when you cannot project uh, the perception of yourself that under any circumstances you will dodge the fight. But, what, but there is also bad news. The bad news is that uh, in this world, not only economy and military power matters, what also matters is the quality of the decision making. It is the same vision and other things. Let me, let me quickly go through like the list of uh, features, for instance, which Russia displays in its decision making and Europe displays in its decision making. Russia knows it wants to revise uh, the current European security order. It not only knows it, it speaks about it, and its policy is built accordingly. Europe, in its very influential quarters, wants to go back to the business as usual. There is a mismatch which works for Russia and does not work for Europe. Russia understands that it lives in the situation of a conflict with the West or with the liberal order, and it's going to be a long and protracted conflict. Europe demonstrates, well, <coughs> certain quarters of Europe demonstrate what we call we need Russia mentality, regardless of what's happening in the real world, absolutizing even of the we need Russia mentality. When you look at the balance of resolve, you have a, fit, a Russia which is ready to invest and make sacrifices, and you have Europe which feels a conflict. You have a risk-taking player and a risk-averse player. You have an actor which knows what its priorities are and knows how to prioritize, especially when it comes to regional priorities. And an actor which often explains its specific failures with the help of the argument that we have too much on the plate. We have to deal with everything. Yes, when you prioritize everything, that means you do not prioritize anything. You have it very much you have one decision-making process that demonstrates unity, and you have another decision-making process which demonstrates discord. You have quick decision-making on the one hand, and you have what is called the leadership crisis on the other hand. Uh, so, to conclude, I do believe that the liberal world can mobilize. Uh, in the history, actually, it proved its ability to mobilize. But this is not a simple thing. And this requires, I'm afraid, a different type of leadership. The type of leadership which, in the words of Winston Churchill, should promise blood, uh, sweat, and tears. And it doesn't. It still does a lot of psychotherapy, saying that things will be fine if you re-elect us. Uh, Populism is not an answer, but populism knows how to address the fears of the people, their discontent with the current system, and this is why, uh, this is this is why basically we are under siege at the moment. Thank you. Ricardo, thank you very much, and uh, last but not least. Uh, Sinan, uh, your, your country ha has been severely challenged uh, by an attempted military coup uh, to undermine the uh, democracy in, in your country. And uh, we have all followed uh, the 15th of July in the aftermath with, with great care. And so I'm sure you will also, by addressing this question, also give us some insight into what's happening as challenge to democracy and liberal order in your country. First of all, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. So thank you very much to us and uh, Romania and GMF for having me here today. 
Uh, Ivan, I have a message to you as well. I will be asking for a bit of your benign neglect if I tend to err on the side of the eight, ten minutes uh, that has been allocated to me. Now, if I were to write the speech, uh, I would put a title, and that title would be uh, The Western Order Under Siege, a Geo-Economic Narrative. I will be talking mostly about geoeconomics rather than the geopolitics or the strategy because I think that the geoeconomic trends are even more important than the others in understanding the ills that, are, that we are facing, the challenges that we are facing, and indeed there are a number of challenges uh, in regard to the functioning of the democratic order in many of our societies as illustrated, yes, Ivan, by the latest coup attempt in Turkey, but many others. So I'll be talking about three main themes, uh, starting with globalization, uh, then technology, uh, and tying it uh, to populism. Why do I think these three themes matter? Uh, essentially because these are the long run, the deep lying trends uh, that have now combined to generate a large enough pool of losers, or seemingly losers, uh, that tend to populate our societies uh, and are the, uh, the type of constituencies that in uh, democratic nations uh, provide for the type of opening uh, that are a threat uh, to uh, democracy and liberalism. Let me start with globalization. Uh, how does globalization affect our democracies? Uh, firstly, uh, through its employment on jobs uh, and its pressure on wages. Uh, when you look at uh, what globalization has done uh, in terms of all the outsourcing, uh, offshoring uh, incentives, uh, but also with the incorporation of China into the global economic system, uh, the impact that it had on Western nations is to uh, essentially provide an upper limit on wages is to uh, push wages down so that gradually we have seen the share between income and wages uh, being uh, leveled against uh, the, uh, the, sal the salaries. So this depression of wages is creating the type of income disparities that are at the source of some of the discontent. So globally, yes, globalization has had a beneficial impact in reducing income disparities among nations. Many people came out of poverty in hundreds of millions, especially in China and India. So in that sense, globalization is good. But at the same time, it tends to increase income disparities within nations. That's how you see all these skewed figures coming out of the US, where the top 10% of income earners have doubled their share in, 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 the, in the total income in the past 20 years. So these are you know, quite some uh, startling figures. The second impact that globalization has had globally is the trend that Danny Roderick, I think, has, uh, has caught very uh, intelligently in the term premature industrialization. What that means is that compared to the trajectory of economic growth and development that we've witnessed in democratic industrialist nations in past decades and even centuries, where you had the share of, in, the share of employment in industry peaking in Germany at about 45%, in the US at about 40%, in France about 36%. Now the share of employment in industry is peaking at developing nations at much lower levels, at around 20%. What that means is that the type of jobs that are available for the developing nations in industry, in industry are much less limited. So that, and the, the remaining jobs that are essential services are either less paying jobs or less volatile or more volatile jobs. And this is creating the type of brittleness uh, in the employment sector uh, that is at the root of some of this discontent uh, because uh, people don't have confidence uh, that in the future, in the future, they will remain employed, that they will have uh, you know, strong uh, economic uh, prospects. So they have less of a stake in status quo and more of a willingness uh, to challenge uh, the status quo. Uh, and this is a trend, therefore, that we see both in democratic and in industrialized nations, but also in the developing world with uh, premature industrialization. Let me see, switch to technology. How does technology affect uh, this backdrop? 
first of all, throughout history, we've seen the very close relationship with, between technology and economic outcomes. Uh, many of us tend to look on technology as a rather favorable trend that has created employment, that has raised the level of productivity, that in a nutshell raised our, you know, our income levels and standard of living. Now, that may be true. The thing that we have been oblivious to, perhaps our generation, is the distribution impact of technology. Now, in the global scheme of things, you know, technology may be a good thing, but when you look at the distribution impact, and what I mean by the distribution impact is that overall technology may be a good thing for society, but it tends to create more and more losers, especially digital technology. We see with industrial, you know, with the, with the industrial revolution how that has affected. But digital technology is more pernicious. The linkage between technological dissemination and uh, the more widespread use of technology and employment creation has become less and less visible. When we see this, we see this in basically the elasticity of growth to employment. Growth does not tend to generate employment anymore. We have growth in some societies more, in some societies less, but we're nowhere near the type of job creation that we've been accustomed to in the previous decades. And technology has a lot to do with that. Because what technology does is not only it generates productivity, so you need you know, less labor to generate with the same type of output, but it also shifts the fundamental structures of competition and, uh, and, and, and the market. What I mean by that is that when you have, uh, you know, digitally, especially more and more uh, share of the economy uh, being part of the digital economy, you are creating a, a structure almost where a winner takes it all. This is the example where in many of these large marketplaces you have only one brand name. This is the, you know, the, the, the world of Amazon. This is the world of Uber. This is the world uh, of uh, Alibaba. And uh, just to give you an example, uh, do you know how many, what is the number of employment at Uber? By the way, Uber has a market cap of about 62 billion. So about you know, a third of Romania's GDP, Romania is about 180 billion, right? So Uber at 62 billion market cap. Total employment at Uber is at the last count 6,723. Now, it's as if the whole Romanian economy is generating 20,000 jobs. Think about that for a moment. This is the type of world that we're heading into. This is the type of impact that technology is having on labor markets and labor market outcomes. Uh, this uh, is also what is fueling uh, populism. Uh, a further trend that I want to very briefly address is also in under the, under technology. Just a few figures about what's what's you know why I think this is going to accelerate, uh, and just a few trends perhaps about robotics. Uh, this is a trend that will continue to accelerate uh, by having a almost an outsized influence on our labor uh, markets. There has been studies that show that. 47% of jobs in OECD states are susceptible to automation, which means that with further investment in artificial intelligence and robotics, they may disappear. Uh, another study, an OECD back study, puts it at 9%, so we don't really know how much. But this is going to be uh, quite a, uh, a difficult trend. Now, this, I don't, I'm not saying this to in any way denigrate the benefits of technology or globalization, but I'm saying this that we cannot anymore remain oblivious to the distributional consequences of these deep lying trends. And the more so since we cannot roll back any of this. We can't really roll back globalization. We can't roll back the advancement of technology. So therefore we'll have to start to think much more seriously and constructively about what we can do. Because this is exactly generating 
the type of uh, constituencies which is fueling the growth of populism of you know and of radicalization uh, of uh, anti-europe uh, messaging in our societies this is combined with something relatively new that we've witnessed also in the US with the presidential debates but also in many other places people have used the term of post-truth society to describe this phenomenon what that means is that political leaders or even any other leader in society can actually get away with regurgitating lies. There is no cost to lying in front of an audience, in front of a political audience, in democratic societies. Now, why is that? Think for a moment. There are perhaps two you know, explanations. One, it's about the messenger. The fact that trust has been eroded in the political leadership and in institutions as a result of all this accumulated impact uh, on, uh, on our economy uh, makes it that the messages that we get, through, that we hear from that leadership, we become oblivious to. We don't want to listen to those messages. And the second thing is the, uh, the way that these messages are relayed. The fact that media is so fragmented, balkanized is not the word that I want to use, but fragmented, social media tends to create the type of echo chambers where we only listen what we want to listen to. We don't get exposed to the type of messaging of the other side, and that tends to further undermine the cohesiveness uh, and really uh, increase uh, the gap of information in democratic societies. Finally, uh, where you know, how, so how 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 can we conclude? Where where do we go next? I think the first thing that uh, we need to address is to realize that something's broken, that we cannot continue, that the system that we've come to cherish, Western internationalism, liberalism, uh, the global governance, has to be fixed. We have to fix it in order to save it. And in, Ivan word, in Ivan's words, I think the complacency that we had in relation to the system has to end. So we have to start with uh, the recognition that this system has to be fixed. We have to move beyond the state of denial to a state of acceptance. Secondly, uh, we have to uh, start to think more constructively about what we need to do to fix this system. I'm not you know, here championing a major overhaul of the system, but there are indeed many areas where this system can be fixed. Just to give you one example, uh, I don't want to, you know, you'll recognize the company, I don't want to use the name, but there's a global company that was fined by the European Commission a couple of weeks ago uh, in relation to a tax case in Ireland. Now, the amount in question was 13 billion euros. And according to the Commission documents, the effective tax rate on that company, on the profits, by the way, not revenue, the pro on the profits was 0.001%. That's the effective tax rate. Now, I think that needs to be fixed. I'm sure that everything is legal, but is it ethical? You know, how do we go on uh, protecting a system like this that tends to generate the type of uh, disparities, the type of a feeling of uh, you know, having been losers of the cycle of globalization and technology. Can you yes, I'm, I'm finishing. Uh, there are other areas, you know, like uh, you know, international uh, intellectual property rights, agricultural trade, many areas that we can address. Now, I want to leave you with the question after you know this this prognosis, uh, the question about uh, the praxis, who who should take the lead where we should start to address these issues. Is it the G20? Is it the WTO? Is it the EU? Is it the uh, you know, EU-US strategic dialogues? But I think we should all start to think about what we can do at the supranational level 
because here, um, you know, I, I will overlap with what Jan said, there is an issue about the failure of sophisticated states. It's not that they're not aware of this, but it's just that the solutions to many of these trends are not anymore at the national level, and there needs to be some supranational or international sense of initiative, sense of responsibility uh, that must uh, be brought about. Thank you. Thank you, Sinan, and uh, don't pull the next time on like that. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, the organizers have given us another 15 minutes until 12.15. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very glad that Sinan, you brought this whole issue because this is really what underpins uh, the fear, the angst uh, of, of people. And uh, I like to say that people are, we all are very resilient, you know, since the beginning of the movement of enclosure of industries throughout the Western world. In 96, in Minnesota, when I came there, uh, a handyman said, you know, what will my children do? The factories are all closing. That was 20 years ago. So people are patient, and they wait for their elected leaders to deliver. But after 20 years, when they don't deliver, you know, there's a moment that when the straw breaks the camel back, and I think that's what it is. So all the pleas that we have heard, and. Uh, from Jan and others about the need to adapt. You know, we can't just pretend that things will go on forever like this. Requires, uh, begs many questions, but for me also the role of the state. You know, we, there was this total illusion that markets will solve everything. <clears throat> you know, that simply, you, you know, you leave the unfettered forces of the market and things will, will correct, also correct themselves. They don't. You know, pharmaceutical industry will not invest 20 billion to find the new antibiotic to fight the bugs in the hospitals. Uh, someone has to do it. Uh, fast speed trains or highways in the US were built by Eisenhower, not by private firms. So I think that's one among many questions. I will take three questions from the audience and then I'll come back to the panel. Uh, so I saw Bad Sokka first, uh, the second one, anyone here? And over there. Okay. I'll take four in the lady over there. From Zafar Ajanen from Istanbul Shehir University Center for Modern Turkish Studies. Actually, first I will start with the roots and the values of the EU. Just please correct me that about the roots that the an Asian abducted woman, a Middle Eastern abducted woman, a Phoenician princess, gave its name to Europe. Right, the European the Phoenician princess, the Europe. The secondly, the political and economic identity of Europe, which is given by the an Asian migrant uh, sons and uh, Ayana sons Romos. The third one is about the a Middle Eastern prophet and uh, his, his followers gave his religion to the continent. This is the roots. Well, and I think the Santa Claus is also from the Middle East. It's not from Europe itself. Let us remind you that. The first, please correct me if I am wrong. The, the second one is about the liberal order is under siege. Yes, but you, mostly it's about speaking about the global challenges of to the liberal order. But the, for Europe, it's most coming from the inside rather than the outside. But I will also to continue with about it. What's more surprising for the speech is no one is touch upon the, ex, the rise of extreme right in Europe which is undermining the liberal order uh, in Europe rather than the other issues. The liberal order is under siege by the, the, ex, the rise of the extreme right. The, the alternative for Deutschland is one of the examples of national front or the urban fields in uh, Hungary. Also, the, the, the rise of the, the, the uh, right wing or extreme right radical known as a party is, is growing. Assassination of the, the co pacts in UK is one of the good examples, or Theresa May's discourses. It's more close to the neo-Nazis rather than the right parties, central right parties. The gap between central, gap, central right or all other parties to the, the, uh, the extreme right parties, especially in a discourse level, it's, it's in a discourse level, it's, it's, it's closing. And uh, the policies is also that they are uh, what they are, uh, let's say, supposing or offering to the society is almost similar to the uh, neo-Nazi parties or radical parties. This is the more 
challenges for the liberal world than the migrants, I think so. Since migrants or refugees is coming to Europe to create a new Europe, not to, to disrupt Europe, I think so. Thank you. My name is Anna Harrison. I'm a journalist working for Radio France International in the Bucharest office. Um, I've been listening and listening and listening to all of you. And I'm wondering if we don't have a communication problem because, for example, we talk about liberalism and uh, extremism and populism. In Romania, some people raised 3 million signatures about gay pe uh, 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 against gay people without even knowing what gays are. Um, in Poland, the government is trying to, uh, to not let women have any kind of, abo of abortion. Do they know that thousands of women died in Romania during, during Ceausescu's uh, years? In Britain, people voted to exit the European, the European Union. I'm a journalist and a communicator. I did not see any campaign from the European Union towards the British people explaining what EU is and what are the benefits. My, um, my uh, father-in-law, recently came to visit, and uh, I asked him, so how did you vote? And he started to roll his eyes, and, and I was like, you voted no. Uh, you voted to exit the European Union. And he, he told me, I think we were, I think we were lied to. So I'm asking myself, as an intelligent person, as a journalist, why don't we communicate better? We are crying that liberalism is disappearing, but European Union is not even, uh, can't even make a communication campaign. And then, so this is my first question. Is it my impression that we don't communicate to our citizens what we are? And why is it good to, to uh, for example, for the Brits to be in the EU? And my, my second question is, are we too laxist? In, uh, in Western countries, I hear many problems about integrations of people coming from the colonies, Marx, uh, Muslims, etc., etc. I hear uh, things about political correct correctness. Are we too laxist? Because we have laws uh, protecting human rights, and we can use these kind of laws to explain to uh, people coming from other cultures what our values are. So this, this, as a communicator and as a journalist, is my opinion that we are laxist and we don't know how to communicate. Thank you. And finally, there was a question. Please keep it short. Well, my name is Ionescu. I am uh, from Bucharest, uh, head of the Institute of Defense Policy. It's more a linguistical uh, uh, question. As a matter of fact, I have uh, uh, waited for uh, 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 an explanation concerning how to say, an, uh, offering an answer from the panelists to these questions about the outside dangers. Being under siege would mean that somebody else is attacking us, you know? So from that point of view, I am asking yourself if uh, your presentation would have been different if uh, uh, the question would, that would have been phrased in another way. So you have uh, uh, underlined especially the dangers from within, almost uh, avoiding to talk about the dangers of uh, outside, of from coming, from, uh, coming up from the outside world. So my question is, would have been more optimistic terms of your intervention if the phrase of the question would have been in another way. Thank you. We have talked about the outside, and uh, Mr. Arkady talked about the, the Russian uh, threat, uh, and others also. So I will now, of course, ask the impossible of, of my co-panelists here uh, to give their pick and choose in the answers and give one to two minute responses, because we do try and abide by the rules of, of this conference game. <laughs> We need to move on. So uh, I'll go in the reverse order and uh, see now first. Having listened to the questions from the audience, um, 
thing I need to say that many of the things that we heard, to me, are symptoms of the ills. Whether it is the far right, whether it's the challenge to you know the, the exclusion of conservatives, whether it's anti-gay platforms, what we see is really a type of populism that is driven by the politics of identity and polarization. And this is from somebody who has been exposed to, the, to this for the past decade in my own country. And it works. So my question is, why does it work? And that's why I think that the, the causes are somewhere else. These are symptoms. We see this all over Eastern Europe. We see this in the US. We see it in Brexit. So the question is, can we capture why there is today a political environment favorable to such political campaigns that polarizes societies, that tend to champion agendas which we believers in an international system, in the type of values that we cherish, tend to distance ourselves. But it works. So that's why I'm trying to go back and try to understand what the drivers of these changes are. So in that sense, these are all symptoms to me. Thank you, Sinan. Uh, very quickly, yeah. uh, for me, the weakness really starts at home. And this is what I was trying to say. Because when, when you feel strong, and when your own society uh, is not vulnerable to the propaganda coming from the outside, then you're not under siege. Because it's, as I said, when the autocrats in other parts of the world, when non-liberal and anti-liberal rulers in the other parts of the world, when they feel the, when they feel the weaknesses, uh, of the liberal world, this is when they start the siege. Uh, that's, that's why I think putting the, whole, uh, the own house in order <coughs> is the primary thing, is the first thing that needs to be done. And without that, uh, the challenges coming from the outside cannot be successfully met and neutralized. Thank you very much. Uh, and on the communication, one thing. Communication may be part of the problem, but it's definitely not the whole problem. And again, this is something that I said in the beginning. In the 90s, I don't think that the EU, for instance, was communicating any better. But it didn't need that communication because it was functioning. The citizens saw it. The problems were not yet that great. It is our problem that actually when the problem, when the problem started to grow, the EU and also politicians at the national level, they chose to silence the problems rather than to confront them outright, up front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, two quick points, one on communications as well. I agree with um, Akadi. I'm always getting slightly nervous when, um, you know, the chagrin that people have with the political system is um, you know, blamed on bad communications, uh, you know, as a key role. It's mostly actually based uh, on bad performance. Um, communications can get you so far in alleviating a situation where you're failing, but not very far. Uh, I, I was working in the German Defense Ministry's communications department for five and a half years, um, and, uh, and that was the most dysfunctional part um, of the building. But the problems that the German Armed Forces at the time had was, was not created there, it was created elsewhere. Um, and so, uh, but you know, to um, you know, answer to your question, yes, of course, governments don't play the communications game very well. Um, not that it would make an awful lot of a difference when they don't perform, um, but when they do perform, as actually sometimes on occasion happens, then they're not you know, very good at picking the fight either because the craft of communicating well doesn't seem to square very well with, with government work, it seems uh, to me. Now on the conservative issue that was raised by the gentleman from the Jamestown Foundation, I've never considered myself uh, a particularly left-wing person, I have to say, but your argument always leaves me a bit you know, puzzled. Um, because these conservative movements that you were referring to, the AFD, uh, perhaps even the PEN, um, some of the other you know, forces that we've seen emerging in Britain and elsewhere, um, are not conservative movements. They're revolutionary movements. They hold everything in disdain that a regular conservative would cherish. Institutions, for the most part, they have more vitriol and more acid against traditional um, conservative values you know, than uh, the lefties that are being blamed for destroying Western society. Um, the, the big problem with conservative is Europe, conservatives in Europe that is that you know, they themselves are not particularly smart at picking the fight. And so what happens instead is, 
that the movements that claim to be conservative are in fact actually revolutionaries who want to get rid of the structures that we have. So I wouldn't put my hope as a conservative into those movements at all. And finally, last but not least, Mr. Thank you very much. I think in communication, it's very easy to say that uh, uh, the migrants uh, could be blamed, but it's very difficult to say uh, to, you know, to praise for their diversity. Uh, it's very easy to say yes or no, or it's very it's very difficult to say that uh, look we have various aspects of the, this problem, and and that uh, I believe that this is the problem that we face today that we forgot who we are, and that's why we forgot to tell to the ordinary people what we're standing for. It's the same in the uh, Western in the external threats. Um, if you are weak. You're under the siege. So to be strong, you have to recognize who, are, who you are and to send a message to those guys that uh, potentially can, uh, can be your enemy. Uh, 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 Arkady mentioned Putin several times. Putin is pushing us to the limits. And to accept that kind of uh, uh, order playing uh, uh, that uh, uh, Putin is uh, it's, uh, uh, it's against us. I, I personally believe that. Uh, it's it's only up to us, not up to him. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a, a huge topic, uh, one of the fundamental <coughs> topics uh, that we are confronted with. Uh, I think that we covered quite a lot of ground uh, in a very short period of time. I'd like to thank you for your questions, and now please join me in thanking the panel.